Well, hello, everybody. Here we are with another episode of Seize Your Business. Today, our guest is Tom Kastner. Tom is a M&A professional with Woodbridge. And uh, we're going to talk today uh, about kind of uh, preparing for the sale of your business. And one of the things I heard once upon a time that I'm going to ask Tom to comment about is to find out if an owner is really ready to sell, you always want to ask them, what are they going to do next? Because if they don't have a plan, they may not be that committed to the business. So, Tom, you know, what do you comment on that statement? Agree, disagree? What? Uh... Sure. Well, first, thank, thanks a lot for having me. Oh, you're welcome. And, it's our uh, pleasure. Uh, thanks for being here, Tom. And certainly, um, you know, it, it, it helps to have a plan, absolutely, because the, the process, uh, whether it's quick or it takes a little longer than planned, um, you know, can be a lot of work. And mm -hmm. so uh, it definitely helps if an owner has uh, has a goal besides just uh, not going to work anymore. Um, and, you know, we, we certainly uh, try to ask that, but we also try to make sure that the owner has uh, has thought it out pretty carefully. What, what types of goals do you, uh, do you hear from owners other than not going to work anymore and making a lot of money off of the sale? Sure. Well, <laughs> I mean, retirement is, is pretty uh, pretty popular. Uh, perhaps they already have a place in Florida or out west somewhere, or they have plans to spend more time with the grandkids or, or with the kids, or they're planning a, a, a second career of some sort. Okay. So uh, take us through the process kind of step by step. If I, if I decide today that, you know, maybe in five years I think I'm going to want to sell my business, how do, sure. I, how do I get started? Yeah, so it, it is best to prepare as early as possible. In fact, uh, uh, there's a lot of people today who start preparing before they even uh, start the company, as a matter of fact. Uh, but, you know, just as if you were going to sell your home or something like that, um, you know, it, you, you wouldn't just put your home out on the market. You, you know, mow the lawn and put yeah, get the granite countertops and stuff. Exactly. Uh, you know, clean it up a little bit, and that's what we, uh, we you know, with with any business, it's it's the same sort of idea that um, you know, whether it's legal planning, financial planning, uh, personal wealth planning, or speaking with uh, an investment banker or business broker, um, you know, about what. Uh, you know, what to work on with the business, what are some of the risks, what are some of the attractive aspects of the business. Uh, it's always best to plan ahead. So do you guys, are, are you guys business brokers or do you just consult with people to prepare their business for sure. sale? So, you know, there, there's business brokers and there's intermediaries and investment banking. And so it pretty runs the, pretty much runs the gamut from uh, Main Street, which is more of a business broker, uh, your your gas stations and your dry cleaners and so on. Uh, generally, that's businesses under say a million or so in revenue, and then somewhere around a million to five million or so in revenue or deal size. Uh, we 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 would call ourselves uh, intermediaries, and then somewhere around around uh, five million or so in deal size. Uh, then they're more commonly referred to as uh, investment bankers. And okay. so it, at Woodbridge, we consider ourselves investment bankers. Uh, generally working on deals uh, estimated to be five million in deal size and above. Okay, um, so I, I assume a lot of people with a five million dollar company have a lot of their ducks in a row before they come to you. But well, you'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so if I come to you and say, you know, listen, Tom, I'm looking to sell my company. I don't have any systems in place. Mm -hmm. I don't have, uh, you know, maybe I haven't done my corporate meeting minutes for the past, you know, five sure. years, and I, I'm really disorganized. What's, what do you, how, how do you coach me into getting things ready to actually sell? Yeah, sure. So, you know, we, we've been through it before. We've seen what buyers look for. Um, what are some of the pitfalls and, and risk factors? You know, any, no matter how much you prepare, every business has risk factors, and some of them you can start to work on. Some of them. You, there, there's nothing you can do, but at least you can explain them and uh, and have them prop the you know the issues uh, properly documented. So, what are some risk factors that you commonly yeah, see? Yeah, sure. So, the, the the biggest risk factors are really um, customer concentration. You see that a lot, big big companies or small. Does that mean all of our business comes from this one one customer, yeah. basically? Yeah. And generally, you know, all, all buyers are different, but. Uh, buyers start to get nervous at around 20% of sales. Okay. And then we've sold businesses with 90% of sales to, to one customer. Uh, you just have to you know, 
plan for it okay. and, and adjust for it. Um, uh, so customer concentration is a biggie. Uh, key person risk. If the owner is is too involved in the business and the business revolves around the owner too much, uh, that's a big risk. Um, so one of the things you can do to prepare your business for sales is probably start to create systems and make it so that the business can run without you. That's right. A, a lot of people will eventually start to hire a, a larger manage, management team, a uh, better prepared management team. Uh, and you know, we, we have clients who take off you know, six, ten weeks or even more during the winter, move to Florida. That's a pretty good indication that the business can, can run itself with, without the owner being there every day. And then there's other owners who you know, have to be there sure. uh, 60, right. 80 hours a week or they don't think it'll, it'll run. So, Tom, um, let me ask this question. You know, in, in my life experience, you know, I've bought a lot of different things. You know, I bought a couple of houses. I bought a lot of cars. I used to speculate on cars. And, and it seems like of all the things I've bought or talk to people about buying it, it seems like the business owner has the most inflated sense of the value relative to anything else. Sure. What Can you give us any guidelines, of, you know, what are valuations at like today, especially for, for sure. you know, like some of these uh, more privately held companies, EBITDA doesn't always tell the story. Well, um, so it's, it is very much true that uh, uh, I'd say 80, 90 percent of business owners uh, have a higher expectation of value than uh, what the market is, is, is going to support. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the vast majority have a, a, a higher a higher expectation. Mm -hmm. uh, so of course that's part of part of our process is to talk to them about the market. Uh, some owners are very very well educated on, mm -hmm. on that fact. Um, but it, in general, uh, businesses are valued either as a uh, a multiple of, of EBITDA, multiple mm -hmm. of earnings. Uh, Can you explain yeah. what, what EBITDA means? Yeah, sure. So well, e EBITDA is earnings before uh, interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It, it's really a, a fancy way of saying adjusted cash flow. Okay. Um, and so it's it's one, um, one valuation method. Um, often people also look at assets. Um, and then we, we often adjust uh, EBITDA for things like owner's compensation, other personal expenses, uh, to sort of true up what the earnings really are. Sure. So if the cash flow is looking low because the owners, you know, basically taking a lot out of the company for themselves, you can adjust that yeah. upward. We, we would adjust their compensation for a, a market rate. Okay. And is it three years of EBITDA that you look at to value you, a company? To you know, all, all companies are different. And if you asked uh, 10 people, you'd probably get 10 different uh, uh, evaluations. So generally, we speak in, in ranges, um, say four to five times EBITDA for some businesses. If they're growing faster or uh, they're in kind of a hot area, maybe it's six, seven, eight times. On uh, some sectors, you can talk about two, three, four times revenue. Okay. Uh, so it, it, it really depends on the sector and the business. And it, is it... Is it um also fair time to try to understand what the buyer is actually buying in terms of uh, a going concern business that they intend to operate or it could be a technology it could be uh, entrance to a market where there's high barriers to entry there's a lot of variables right absolutely and that's that's why that, that's really where we come in not only to showcase the business but also to try to get it out to as many potential buyers as possible uh, mm -hmm. because you know, sometimes the, the worst offers you get are from the guys just down the street or, or people in your own industry. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the best offers you get are from people who you know, are, are so-called, say, wannabes, uh, people who have a strategic interest in your, your industry and your geography and your products. And they're, they're close enough, so there's a fit, but they're mm -hmm. not so close that they, they don't know you too well. Yeah, right, right. So what, um, oh, I'm sure you've you've probably had some deals that went smooth and some deals that were maybe more problematic. What what kinds of things go wrong or what impedes sure. the smooth closing yeah. of the business? Yeah. No, the, the biggest sale. thing, so really the biggest reason why any deals do not get done or don't get completed 
are that the um, if the earnings uh, do not meet expectations or be begin to fall below uh, below projections. Mm -hmm. um, so that's by by far the number one reason. Uh, the other reasons, you know, things come up in due diligence that aren't expected. So of course that that goes back to being prepared and uh, having people review your business before you go to market. Uh, also, just not not having uh, not being able to react quickly enough to questions or um, you know, not having proper uh, financial reporting mm -hmm. is, is mm -hmm. another big thing. Now, I mean, you know, sometimes the economy. Uh, goes sideways, or something happens out in the world, uh, but by far it's earnings. Okay, so seeing some sort of uh, disruption to the earnings as the owner is maybe losing interest or focusing on other things or just something happening yeah. in the marketplace. You know? well, I, I, I think, you know, especially for a number of years here, we've had a, a bit of a choppy economy. Mm -hmm. So most people, uh, before they go to market, they want to see that their business has two or three years of, of earnings. And then you know it takes a while to prepare to go to market, and then we're in market, and then so for a lot of companies to ask for them to uh, consistently grow revenues and earnings for three or four years, it's been a little difficult in this yeah, environment. Yeah. You just made me think of something. You just you just helped me invent something. I <laughs> want <laughs> a piece of action. <laughs> yeah, when we talk when we talk to business owners, we could say like, what are your earnings? And what are your yearnings? Like the money they wish they were making, you know? That would probably be. Uh, sure, sure. We could we could market them three times yearnings. Yeah. No, well, I'm just teasing, I, I but think, that it is uh, is a good point. Well, I think a lot of what we do to help prepare companies go to market mm -hmm. uh, can help the business in general anyway. Mm -hmm. So whether you're looking mm -hmm. five years out or three years out or even ten years out, um, you know, it's it, it's generally good practices to have with the business anyway. And can really uh, point out some some of the aspects of the business that are either risks or might not be so attractive to yeah. yeah. Can you can you share with us? I know we we won't talk specifics, but sort of generally a, a you know a, a, excuse me a story of a business closing that or a business that was hard to sell and how you packaged it or you know what would be like kind of just one of the more interesting things you've encountered in your career yeah sure so um you know don't want to talk too specific you know name names of course, like of that. course. um uh, but you know we, we've had uh say owners have health issues or even pass away and then you know families taking over um and then uh, but you know still got through it mm -hmm. uh, so you know that that sort of speaks a bit to uh being properly prepared but also making sure to go out to a wide range of buyers so if, if something happens with the business and that turns off the first or second buyer well you still have backups mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. got it got it can you explain the, the due diligence process a little bit to people and what uh what that looks like and what what sort of diligence that the buyers actually do on in that process sure. Well, that, that's, again, uh, another reason why we try to prepare our, our clients before going to market because, you know, you're, you're all happy you signed a, a letter of intent, you're going to get a lot of money, and then you get probably just about the next thing you get is the due diligence request list, which can be 18 or 20 pages, and you're like, oh, my God, oh, you know, <laughs> who's going to do this? Yeah. Well, you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if we've already gone through a, a sample due diligence list with the owner and their team, and we've already populated a data room with 75% you know, or more of, of the documents, that at least makes the first steps very easy, mm -hmm. uh, or relatively easy. Um, you know, due diligence can still be a very onerous pro process, and you know, we, we do find that, um, you know, again, in this environment, that we're in now since since 08 or so, the due diligence does seem to be, uh, you know, tougher and tougher. Uh, so, but I, again, properly preparing and then uh, having the systems in place as far as financial reporting, uh, having a, a good management team so you can respond to any questions or requests for information is, you know, not only it makes you look better, but it helps the process move more, uh, more quickly and smoothly. So if someone's looking to buy or sell a business uh, or would like some advice on the topic, how can they reach you? 
Oh, absolutely. So, um, yeah, our website is uh, well. You can you can Google Woodbridge International, okay. uh, and we're 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 right at the top. Uh, the website is woodbridgegrp.com. Okay. Um, and always happy to talk. And uh, your your uh, cell phone or phone number? Yeah, sure. You? Phone number. Uh, my my personal phone number at the office is eight four seven four three one three nine nine three. Okay. Kevin, if somebody needs legal uh, counsel, what's uh, how can yeah, you get can, a hold of you? You can reach me at my law firm, O'Flaherty Law. We do just about everything. Uh, my phone number is 630-324-6666. Uh, calling me is the easy, easiest way to schedule a free consultation. Uh, if you want to download podcast episodes, either in audio or video form, uh, or get information on our guests, uh, that'll be on seizeyourbusiness.com. And Jim, how can how can you be reached? Yeah, uh, Easiest way is just call me, 630-272-3895, and uh, just talk to me about what's going on in your, your business or your career. If I can't help you, I probably know somebody who can. And for first-time listeners, Jim, I don't think you ever told everybody what you do. Well, I do uh, business coaching and consulting primarily. I also do some uh, comedy training for business. Uh, you can find some details on that at improv-4-business.com. And uh, amazing how, uh, how people become more comfortable after a little training. Well, thanks, Tom. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Oh, thanks for having me. Okay. Super. Super.